Hello again everyone, I'm Miss Davis and today we're going to look at animal behavior. The study of animal behavior under natural conditions is called ethology. Behavior is a response to any environmental stimulus. There are also two main categories of behavior we're going to discuss. Innate behavior, which is automatic, and it's genetically pre-programmed. So a lot of times we would say this is like an instinct. Learned behavior is brought about due to experience. So it changes based on what experience is you have had or the organism or animal has had. This is an adaptive behavior that involves changing a pre-existing behavior based on what you've learned. This brings up the argument of nature versus nurture. However, you are a combination of both. Nature is the innate or genetic behavior, whereas nurture is the learned behavior due to your environment. The purpose of behavior is for survival, such as obtaining food, shelter, space, mates, and also avoiding predators. So you can see here we've got a few things going on. You have these kangaroos fighting and these bears fighting. A lot of times that could be that they're fighting for mates. They could be fighting for food. Okay. You can see here that you have the bleeding ground squirrel. This guy is actually um, warning other squirrels against danger, so he would be um, trying to avoid predators. Down here the peacock, of course those are going to be where they show the feathers off and they display in order to get mates. And then down here you can see that we have social groups here with monkeys and this is going to be where they're building they're building up a type of society which we'll talk about later. Now because of this guys, the this means that behaviors are going to be naturally selected. Animals with um, behaviors that best help them meet their basic needs for survival are naturally selected to produce more offspring. This is ensuring that their genes are passed on into the next generation. This is what we call survival of the fittest. Fitness is measured by the animal surviving and reproducing. Okay, they have to reproduce as well. This means they're contributing to the gene pool, which is the next generation. That's what true fitness is, surviving and reproducing. Now, behavior is influenced by two major body systems, the nervous system and the endocrine system. The nervous system produces quick responses via electrical or nerve impulses. The endocrine system produces a response via chemical messages such as hormones. The complexity of an animal's behavior depends on the level of development of the central nervous system and also if there's an endocrine system even present. Invertebrate animals are more apt to respond using innate behaviors because their nervous system is not very well developed. They have a limited ability to process um, external stimuli and they're going to not be able to react in complex behaviors. Theirs are going to be more kind of like reflexes. Like the jellyfish, when it touches something, it automatically stings. It doesn't investigate what it's touching, if it's a threat or whatever, it just stings. Now, they also typically have a shorter lifespan and no maternal nurturing. Okay, their mom doesn't um, give them parenting. Okay, the advantages to genetic responses are that there is no learning period required and they can accurately perform the behavior the first time they do it. Okay, so those are some advantages. So let's talk about some of these innate behaviors. The first behavior we want to talk about are called fixed action patterns, or FAPs. These are a type of innate behavior. They, in, they are initiated by a sign stimulus, so something initiates it. And once it's initiated, it has to go to completion. An example here is the male stickleback fish. They exhibit aggressive territoriality. So they have a territory and they're going to um, defend it very aggressively. When they see a red-bellied organism, that's their sign stimulus and they attack until the stimulus is removed, until the red-bellied object leaves their, their territory. Another example are the digger wasps. Digger wasps drop a paralyzed insect near the opening of their nest. Now, before taking their provisions or their food into their nest, the wasp first has to go inspect the nest, leaving the prey outside. They want to make sure that there's nothing on the inside there. If they drop the prey, it'll be taken and eaten by something else. So during the inspection of the nest, an experimenter or a scientist can move the prey a few inches away from the opening of the nest. When the wasp emerges from the nest, ready to drag the prey inside, it finds that the prey is missing. So the wasp quickly goes and locates the prey again. But instead of taking it directly back into its, its burrow, 
it drops the prey outside, and it goes and specks its nest again, even though it just did it. The, the experimenter can then move it again, and he would continue to do this every time. It has to inspect the nest before it can bring the prey in, even though it just completed it. Egg rolling in geese is another example, and here you can see the picture. When the egg is removed from a, ge a goose's nest, it will roll it back in using its beak and neck into the nest. But you'll see here how the scientist moves the egg. Even though the goose is not rolling an egg anymore, it has to complete the action all the way back to the nest. Okay? I kind of consider this more of like an OCD type behavior. They have to do it all the way to completion, and this is what we call the FAPs. Now there can be modifications to these FAPs um, that can be learned through experience. Um, this is learning because the FAP can improve. Um, laughing gold chicks, like uh, seagull chicks, um, they have an FAP that when they see a red stick like the bill of their parent, they will peck at it. And when they peck at it, the parent gives them food. Well, that's genetic. They automatically do it. However, the older they get, the more accurate they get at hitting the beak. So that's where they learn. As they get better motor skills, they actually learn how to um, do the action better. Okay, so that's what we call modified FAP. Other innate behaviors include reflexes, which are rapid, involuntary responses to a stimulus, which remain through the lifetime of the individual. Some examples of reflexes we have are blinking, hiccuping, and sneezing. Now, instincts are similar to reflexes, but they're more valuable in helping um, adapt to, your, to their surroundings, okay? Some examples of instincts are seen in how different species of lovebirds will build, build their nests. One spe species carries long strips of leaves to be woven into the nest, which you can see here in the top picture. Another carries short strips in its tail feathers so that it can carry more than one strip to be woven in at a time, which you can see in the bottom species. Now, these two species are closely related and they can interbreed or mate. Their offspring of this cross actually show an intermediate where they, they get medium length leave um, pieces. The problem is though, neither one is real efficient. They, don't, they only can carry one at a time still in their beak, but they still can't carry more than one in their tail. And so, even though they're an intermediate and they get medium length pieces, um, they're not as successful as the two seen here. Now this is also seen in different populations of garter snakes, especially the California garter snake. The inland populations are more aquatic and they're going to feed underwater on frogs and fish. <clears throat> the coastal populations are more terrestrial, meaning they're going to live more on land, and they like to feed on slugs. The inland species refuse to eat slugs. They won't eat it because they like to eat the frogs and the fish. Again, though, if they're crossed with the um, if they're crossed the inland with the coastal, the offspring that result will have an intermediate acceptance to consuming slugs. So they may not eat slugs that often, but they will eat slugs. Taxis is the next form we want to talk about. Taxis is another form of innate behavior when an organism moves towards or away from a stimulus. Phototaxis is seen here, and it's a response to light. Okay, so they'll move either towards or away from the light. Now moths here have a positive phototaxis where they move towards the light, whereas roaches or cockroaches have a negative where they'll run away from the light. Chemiotaxis is a response to chemical pheromones, and you can see this with the ants. Um, some are used to attract mates, like when a female is in heat, but animals may also mark their territories with this to keep other individuals away. Ants will form a chemical trail that they use um, to where they can follow each other. This is why they walk in a line. It helps them find their home and also be able to go out and find food. So they use this in order to stay in a group. Now some animals like birds are able to use the sun and stars for navigation. Now they do this during seasonal migration which is a complex form of innate behavior. We can also see that here with the um, monarch migration and that's um, a type of butterfly. Okay, but they'll use navigation tools in order to get where they need to go and again it's it's, um, it's in their genetics. It's not something they have to learn. They automatically know where they need to go and travel. Okay, so this is a form of taxis. Again, innate genetic behavior. Learned behaviors are modified due to life experiences of the individual. Vertebrates, which you see here, demonstrate learned behaviors because they have more developed nervous systems and endocrine systems. They also have a longer lifespan and a period of maternal nurturing which allows learning to take place. 
Now, imprinting is the first type of learning that takes place during a sensitive time period. Filial imprinting is when an offspring recognizes its, its parents. Okay, that's like what you see here where I'm um, like Dr. Seuss wrote that book about are you my mom, are you my mom, where the duck is trying to find out who his mom is. Well, these ducks in a sensitive time period will, or geese will figure out who their parents are right off the bat. This is imprinting. They learn who they are in this sensitive time period. Now, sexual imprinting is when the young learns to recognize characteristics of a desirable mate. What's desirable in the opposite sex? And song learning in birds is an example also of imprinting. Songbirds develop species specific songs um, from older adults. So they listen to their, their parents doing the song and that's how they learn it. If the song is not learned by the end of this sensitive period, the bird will never learn its own song. Okay, and so it's important to note that once that sensitive time period is over, this learning is going to cease. It's not going to continue anymore. Now associative learning links behavior to a stimulus. In other words, there are changes in the behavior that involves connections between two events. Classical conditioning um, was studied by Ivan Pavlov. So if you've heard of maybe Pavlov's dog, he observed that dogs will salivate when presented with food. So he decided that he would ring a bell each time he fed the dog, presented the dog with food. Eventually, Pavlov would just ring the bell and not provide food for the dog, but the dog still salivated. It still started um, drooling. Well, the dog began to associate the bell to the food. This means that the individual is conditioned to respond to an irrelevant stimulus. The bell had nothing to do with their food, however, they were conditioned to respond to that bell. Advertisers use this when they use um, sex appeal and commercials to sell their products because that sex appeal may have nothing to do with the product, but it gets them, gets you to where you associate it with that, and that's why you want those products. Now, operant conditioning was studied by B.F. Skinner. He placed a rat in a cage with a lever. When the rat happened to press the lever, he would be rewarded with a sugar pellet, some food. This is when behavior is strengthened by rewards or punishments. We use this type of learning to teach our pets tricks, and we also do this to raise children. So you can look here in this example, this particular one gave you the reward of the food, the food pellet, but if they press the lever at the wrong time or things like that, you'll see that there was the electrical grid here, which would be the negative response was shocking. Okay, so B.F. Skinner wasn't just always about rewards. He also looked at how negative reinforcement worked with this type of behavior as well. Insight learning is a type of what we call innovative reasoning. The individual is able to resolve problems without previous experience. This learning requires critical thinking skills, and it's not practiced. Smart animals are able to perform this type of learning. Chimps can stack boxes in order to retrieve a banana. So you can see here on the bottom, you can see how the chimp is going through the process where the banana is up there, but boxes are laying around the chimp begins to stack the boxes in order to reach the banana. Human children do this as well. Uh, when parents might say, where did you learn that? They may have learned it from innovation, just figuring it out themselves. Now, imitation is learning through observation. Again, human children are very good at this type of learning, but so are monkeys. Japanese macaques were provided food in the form of potatoes on a beach by scientists. Older macaques tried to rub the sand off the potato before they eat them. One younger macaque began washing her potatoes in the ocean. She used innovation. Other younger macaques began washing theirs as well by imitating her. Now, habituation is the last one I want to talk about, and this is when the individual no longer responds to an unimportant stimuli, one that's not important. Um, they become accustomed to the stimulus, which um, allows them to conserve their energy. Um, baby birds normally at first are scared of falling leaves, but once they realize the falling leaves will not hurt them, they begin to ignore them so they don't waste the energy. Um, the macaques did the same thing as they became accustomed to the scientists just watching them. Um, they didn't run away from the scientists anymore, and so that was what we would call habituation. This brings us to the topic of sociobiology. A society is a group of individuals, which is a population of the same species, that is organized in a cooperative manner. Some animals are social and they'll live in groups, while others, they live solitarily. They only join the opposite sex for reproductive purposes. 
Sociobiology is the study of the social behaviors and interactions between members of a group. This allows scientists to see the pros and cons to group living. So let's look at some positives first to group living. Numbers provide more protection from predators. So you can see here like with the meerkats and different organisms like that, they're going to help protect each other from predators. They can also work together to gather food, which is called foraging. So what you see when you look at a pride of lions, they work together to bring down their prey. They are also able to divide the labor within their society to accomplish whatever job. Now the negative aspects of group living include increased competition for limited resources such as food, water, shelter, or even mates. When living in groups, there's also an increased chance for the spread of disease, okay? Because a disease, if one organism or animal gets it, it could spread very easily throughout the group because you're living in close proximity. When animals live in societies, there are several social interactions and, and constructs we should discuss. So first, we're going to talk about ritualizations, which can be displays of aggression or courting. Now, displays of aggression are usually conflicts over limited resources. Most are resolved without any bloodshed, okay? So they're only acting out the aggression, okay? They're only acting it out. The confrontation ends when one individual becomes subordinate to the other. Now this is a type of agnostic behavior, okay, which you can see here. These are all types of aggression where you can see that they'll lock their horns, they may bare their teeth, they may coil up around each other, but they're not trying to intentionally hurt each other, okay. It's normally just an act until one finally submits, but it could result in bloodshed. Courtship rituals are signals used to prepare the sexes for mating. Sexual selection is a form of natural selection favoring features that increase an animal's chance of mating. This means that there are features that are adaptive so they lead to increased fitness. Now remember fitness is a chance to have more offspring. Adaptive mating behaviors for females are related to the fact that they produce a limited number of eggs and they also provide most parental care. This means they're going to be very choosy about their mates. Males, on the other hand, have to compete for access to the females. Their features should aid them in whatever type of competition um, that's present. Male birds of paradise, which you can see here, have flamboyant plumage, like very bright, very extreme feathers. And they dance around making calls to the female. This increases their risk of being captured by predators. However, this is going to attract the female so she can inspect them to see if they're worthy to mate with. Other animals like elk have antlers that attract females and can be used in direct competition with other males, which we saw in the um, aggression type of rituals. Now, within social groups, dominance hierarchies can also develop. These establish a pecking order where higher ranking or alpha individuals are stronger and more fit. Alpha animals have better access to resources before the lower ranking individuals in the group. However, the higher ranking individuals are responsible for defending the group from outsiders. So they're going to have to put themselves on the line if an outsider comes in. This hierarchy reduces aggression between group members until the balance of power starts to shift. This is when a lower ranking individual will challenge an alpha. Okay, so this can shift. This dominance hierarchy is not necessarily set in stone. It can change, but it does help reduce aggression within the group. Now, territoriality is when an individual will defend an area from other animals. Again, this is to reduce aggression between group members and individuals with better territories tend to get better mates, which will improve their reproductive success. Now, a lot of times guys are going to mark their territory somehow. In this particular case, they're marking their territory um, with a type of like urine pheromone type thing, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Now, altruism is a behavior that has the potential to decrease the fitness of an individual in order to protect the members of the group or the society. This is a self-sacrificing behavior because the individual puts itself at risk in order to protect other group members. Now an individual might let out an alarm call, which you see here with the bleeding ground school, squirrel, which draws attention of the threat to them so that the others have a better chance of escaping. 
Now this is beneficial behavior if the group shares common genes, meaning that they're related. The more closely related the individuals are, the more likely they're going to protect each other, and this is known as kin selection. So here's just a kind of cute example. This guy says, I would lay down my life for two brothers or eight cousins. Well, they're more closely related to the brothers, therefore they'll protect them better than they will their cousins. However, they'll still protect the cousins because they do share some genes that are the same. Now, communication facilitates cooperation, which is required within societies. Communication involves action of a sender, which influences the behavior of a receiver. Now, there's several modes of communication that we're going to discuss. First is chemical communication. This uses pheromones that are chemical messages that are passed between members of the same species. Messages are picked up by special receptors. Advantages of chemical communication is that it works in both day and night, and it can work over long distances. So we can see here um, an example is that they're marking their territory, okay? Or you can look down here where it's the female lion is in heat, so it, it, it triggers the male. On the other hand, guys, we release a pheromone, carbon dioxide, that attracts female mosquitoes, and they're the ones that bite us. Okay, so we're actually attracting them by breathing. On the other hand, sometimes animals have adapted to use pheromones to trick other organisms. So here the spider's using moth sex hormones to attract its prey, attracting the male moths to its um, web. Okay, so we can see that. And again, there's a question, do humans use sex pheromones? Well. That's a pretty good question. Why do we put perfume and cologne on? It's normally to attract the opposite sex. So this is a type of chemical communication. The next type is called auditory. Auditory communication are where they're going to use vocalizations. They're going to use sound to do this type of communication. These are useful for mating calls distress signals, and also marking territory boundaries. A lot of times you'll hear in jungles, you can hear monkeys and, and different types of sounds, and a lot of times they're marking off their territory. If you can still hear them, they consider that their territory. Now, auditory communication is faster than chemical communication, and it also works both in the day and night. One thing about auditory communication as well is that you can change the pattern, intensity, and frequency of the call of the sound. Okay, so here we show you birds, but also crickets. Okay, that's why when you get closer to a cricket, they'll stop chirping. Okay, so it's part of that whole process. Okay, this is auditory communication. Now, visual communication is useful in observing rituals like we talked about with aggression and also with courtship. The disadvantage is that it works best only during the day because you have to be able to see it. So at night when it's dark, it's hard to see. Okay, so these would be examples of a type of visual communication. The last type of communication is tactile. This communication uses touch sensations. It is useful in birds so that they can feed their chicks. A lot of times that touch sensation is going to allow the chicks to know because they can't see real well at the beginning that food is coming. In other animals, like you see with monkeys, grooming is going to be important tactile because it helps form bonds. However, the disadvantage to this type of communication is that it requires close proximity between the animals, okay, which then could result in conflict or fights. Now guys, this includes our lecture over animal behavior. I'm going to also be posting along with these um, lecture notes, I'm going to be posting a Word document that has a lot of links to YouTube of, YouTube of videos that reinforce these types of behaviors that we've talked about. Um, there's some kind of funny ones like for classical conditioning like with Pavlov's dog I have a clip from the office where Jim conditions Dwight um, with Altoids. I also have one for the operant conditioning with punishment versus reward um, of a clip off of Big Bang Theory um, where Sheldon is, is trying to modify Penny's behavior by giving her chocolate. And so I give you some of those examples um, that are kind of funny as well, but I also include some animal ones that are going to show you in instinct, um, fixed action patterns, and things like that. So you can view those to get a better idea of what these um, types of behaviors actually look like. Again, guys, if you have any questions over any of the stuff we've covered, please feel free to um, ask, and I hope that these videos are helping you prepare for your test. Now, guys, remember, this is the last unit, so good luck.